Hello everyone, I'm Billy Sanders, and I'm the Director of Research at the IOTA Foundation. Today I want to explain to you how IOTA 2.0 works. We've had a series of blog posts and wiki articles, and if you read and understood all of those, you don't need to watch this video. But I'm here to sort of recap all these things and put them together. Okay, so to understand how IOTA 2.0, we have to understand what we're trying to accomplish, and that is digital autonomy for everyone. Okay, so how do we get digital autonomy? Well, it's by providing a DLT protocol that satisfies certain design principles. These design principles are accessibility, parallelism, volume velocity, social integration, and sustainable tokenomics. Let's go forward. How to sync. This is the cornerstone of DLT theory, right? Now, when a new node joins the network, it wants to know what is the ledger state, right? So it downloads a snapshot file, which contains tips, and from here, you know, builds a new tangle, right? Or if you're in some other DLT, a blockchain, or whatever, right? Now, this is so important because whatever is in the snapshot file, or what is ever committed to in the snapshot file, basically is what is recorded and what is not, right? Because DLTs are all about immutable record. So what is the immutable record? It's contained in the snapshot file. And so this is why this is the core, right? So you download the snapshot file and you have the first immediate question. How do we know that this snapshot is correct, right? You're just downloading a file from the internet. Maybe they, somebody changed it. Maybe someone gave themselves 500 million extra coins or whatever. Okay, the first step to doing this is what we do is we take the snapshot file and compress it down to a commitment, right? And this commitment's timestamped, and that's this number 473 here that corresponds to the time that this snapshot file corresponds to. And then all the snapshot files, or all the commitments to the snapshot files, are formed into a chain, right? Down to the first one, which is the genesis, right? Cool. So, this um, provides uh, an immutable record, right? If you change one of these uh, commitments somewhere, the whole chain changes. And when you join the network, and if you if someone's poisoned the snapshot file, you'll see because your commitment chain will be different than everyone else's, okay? But this begs another question. How do we know that we're on the right commitment chain, right? I mean, an attacker can create a fake snapshot file, then create a fake commitment chain. So. You might discover that there's some sort of problem by having two different chains. What do you do? So what we have is we have a bunch of validator signatures on all of these different commitments, right? And based on these validator signatures, we can say, well, which one's better, right? And you can go back and uh, read the wiki articles to see exactly what our fourth choice rule is. Okay, cool. Next though, we have to determine what goes in these snapshot files, what goes into each of these commitments, okay? And from here, now we have to start talking about blocks and such like that. So first, we'll talk about how blockchains do this, right? To, so we can understand IOTA's approach instead. So blockchains, what you do is we have a bunch of transactions that people propose. And then you have a block producer select some of these transactions and puts them into a block, okay? And then this block gets compressed down into a header and then there's a commitment there with the header. All right, cool. So that's how blockchains work. But the problem is that the block producer controls this whole process. They choose the transaction. And why do they choose transactions? Why are they working? For fees, block rewards. And these things extract value from the system, right? Well, we want to, we want to bypass this, right? We don't want to have to go through this block producer oligopoly that they have. We want something different. So in IOTA 2.0, what we have is, you know, we have our transactions and every user takes their own transaction and creates their own block, right? So therefore we bypass this block producer step by having users produce their own block. All right. And then of course, you know, we take all these blocks down and create a commitment. I'll explain this step in a bit. But the important thing is this is the principle of accessible writing, right? That you can write to the ledger yourself without having to go through another party. Now, what we haven't talked about is how the blocks are created, right? Obviously, it's not going to work for every single user to just create as many blocks as they want, right? Because everyone has to validate the blocks. Okay, so we have to regulate this somehow. And so this is the IOTA congestion control, right? So we do this in three steps. The first step is how do we set the rate? How does uh, someone know, how does the user know how many blocks they should create? Well, each block burns some sort of access credit that we call mana, right? And then when we have too many blocks, we increase how much mana you need to burn, okay? 
and if there's too few blocks, we lower the burn rate. So this makes it that we have the just the burn rate gets adjusted so that we always get happy medium of just the right number of blocks so that uh, that the network has the network's resources are properly allocated. And this effectively makes spamming expensive, right? If you just start spamming the network, you start overusing it, the burn increases. If you start spamming the network, right? If you just start creating blocks, the the burn, the mana burn that you have to do just starts increasing, increasing, increasing becomes way too expensive, way too fast, right? Okay, but how do we get mana, right? Because this whole process here assumes that mana is scarce. Mana is generated by Oda token. You own tokens, right? And then that generates mana. And then that allows you to create blocks to access the network. So the amount of blocks that you're able to create is proportional to the number of IOTA tokens you have. And that's why IOTA is fearless for token holding, okay? Cool. Next step. How do we solve the double burning problem? What happens if someone tries to burn mana twice or burns too much of it? This is very similar to the traditional double spending problem, right? Except for it's about congestion control. So we need to have a solution. So what we do is we have every user who wants to create blocks put down a deposit, right? And it's basically it's just a large dust deposit. And if you overburn, this deposit becomes locked and you can't issue any more blocks. And this, again, is another way where spamming becomes expensive, right? Because if you try to spam by overburning, then your deposit gets locked, and then you have to create uh, another deposit, and then that would get locked. And so the deposit isn't that big for, for every user. But if you try to spam, that is too expensive, right? So what's next? So we have all these blocks are created, and they're being gossiped around the network, OK? Now, we have to manage these blocks. We have to have some sort of rule for the gossip, right? You as a node, right, have all your neighboring nodes. And you're receiving blocks, and then you're taking them, processing them, and then you choose one of these blocks to pass on to all of your peers, right? Okay, how do you do this? How do you decide which blocks to pass on to your peers in what order? Well, we use the deficit round robin schedule. So what you do is you line up all the blocks in the queues, and then you take some blocks from one user, and you schedule them, and you take some blocks from another user, and it works out great, right? But how do we actually represent the user on the ledger? It's via account, okay? This idea that the user has an account that's on the ledger, and that's how they access the protocol. They can issue blocks, they can hold funds, they can manage the IDs, right? So the initial motivation for creating these accounts was for this congestion control, but hey, you can do tons of things with this, right? And this provides a very user-centric focus to the protocol. And this is what we mean by social integration. The design principle of social integration means that we can sort of start to replicate real-world social structures on the ledger itself. And the cornerstone of this is with accounts. All right, so we talked about how to create blocks, but now we have to talk about which blocks are committed. First, though, we have to talk about how our blocks are organized, right? And we organize our blocks in a DAG. I know it's famous for our DAGs. We love DAGs. We're DAG people. And why are we DAG people? It's for her, our design principle of parallelism, right? We want people to be able to process blocks in parallel. Okay, cool. Now let's go back to our question. How are blocks committed? Or how do we decide which blocks are committed? So we do this in a few steps. We have certain uh, special blocks that are issued by validators. And we track then the approvals of these validators. And if enough validators are referencing a block, then we say it's accepted, right? And those then are put into the commitments. So let's see an example. So we see validator one here, and then we flag all the blocks that it references with a one. Now, validator two issues a block, and then everything in past cone gets marked with two, and same thing with validator three. Now, let's just say that three validators is enough to be accepted. Now, all the blocks then with one, two, three can get put into the commitments, right? And the commitments are done by time. We divide this whole tangle, slice it up into slots, and then these slots that have different commitments. All right, cool. Now, as you can see, though, the, these blocks at the front of the tangle, ah, okay, they don't have enough approvals to be committed, but they might get enough approvals uh, as time goes on, right? So basically, then we have a point, a cutoff point where you say, okay, we know that the blocks are not going to receive more approvals, and now we know what is uh, going to be committed and what is not. And this process just is always going on. From this, we can see volume of velocity. We can process a huge amount of transactions, and it's very rapid. 
we don't have these batches of blocks where we get a batch of blocks and we slowly process each one. We have this constant stream of knowledge. Now, also in this approval process, we're able to figure out double spends and things, but I'm not gonna explain that right here. I leave that for the blog posts and the wikis. So we have an obvious question though. Who are these validators? Well, we have tokens that are locked to accounts and then every account holder, every user has two choices. They can either stake these tokens to their account or they can delegate their stake to another account. And then the accounts with the most stake are the validators, right? Super simple, yay. Now, why should you be a validator? Well, validators get extra mana, which you can then use for more throughput. So that's good. And why would you be a delegator? Well, same reason, you get extra mana and you get more throughput, right? You don't get quite as much mana as the validator, but you still get a reward, right? So your users are highly motivated to delegate and then contribute to the security of the network. Now, there's one thing I wanna talk about though. Why are we using rewards and mana, not token? Most blockchains, when you validate, you get token rewards. Why, why do we do something different? So let's answer this question. What do validators usually do with these tokens when they get them? Well, they sell them. And they sell them um, fast, right? And this extracts value from the system. How does our system work instead? Validators and delegators, of course, get mana, right? Now, this works very differently. Now you have two options of what you can do. You can either use it for network access or you can wait and sell your mana, right? Now, why is this different? Well, <laughs> why do you wait, right? To when do you wait? You have to wait until mana is valuable, right? If mana is valuable, what does that mean? It means that network access is valuable, which means that the underlying DLT is being adopted, right? So basically, IOTA 2.0 forces people to invest long-term into the protocol and wait to get any returns out till after there's adoption. And therefore, the tokenomics is sustainable, which is one of our design principles. Instead of it having short-term value extraction, we have long-term investment. So that is how this uh, IOTA 2.0 thing works. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions, we're going to have an AMA soon. And so just drop your comments and questions on Reddit and I will answer them. All right. See you guys.